As 2000 arrived, anime was officially the norm in American pop culture. Thanks to the success of Toonami on Cartoon Network and the obsession of Pokémon, the world that had tried so long to make a name for itself finally did. Toonami would expand throughout all of its Warner Brothers owned stations including network television. The networks would give plenty of child-friendly anime programming. One being the popular card game based Yu-Gi-Oh! and the other being Card Captors. Not only would this be an anime block, but it would also include some very successful shows that made it in the States with a lot of anime influences. Sailor Moon and Gachamon, going by the American name G-Force, would see a triumphant return to television, as well as a successful miniseries, Blue Sub-6, and a three-volume comedy series known today as the Tenshi Saga. With the success of Dragon Ball Z, however, American affiliate Funimation would release a bunch of anime releases on home video. These shows included Blue Gender, Lupin the Third, and Yu Yu Hakusho. At the same time, due to the fact that some of these shows would be advanced for younger viewers, Cartoon Network would add a block to its late night programming. Adult Swim made its television debut in 2001, featuring programming that would cater to the viewing age range of 18 to 35. It featured three new kinds of shows old animated sitcoms that were cancelled before their time, new animated comedy programming, and anime. Adult Swim would be one of the highest rated time blocks on television. The popularity of shows like Aqua Teen Hunger Force, Space Ghost Coast to Coast, and Sea Lab 2021 would grab a lot of media attention. Adult Swim would also stage two of the greatest comebacks in television history by putting syndicated episodes of Matt Groening's Futurama and Seth MacFarlane's Family Guy back on the air. Of course, anime would be overlooked in the news, but the viewing would be just as prominent. American television would see other shows such as Outlaw Star, Cowboy Bebop, and the six-episode Fully Cooly. In 2001, the fans would ask for more anime programming and they would get it as Toonami would expand to Late Night Saturday, featuring nothing but anime programming. It would feature the mecha series Big O, and two new Gundam series new to the United States, Mobile Suit Gundam and Gundam 08 MS Team. Of course, the main stake would be Funimation, as they created their own English dub versions of the very first Akira Toriyama series, Dragon Ball. While fans already knew Dragon Ball Z inside and out, Dragon Ball told the story as Goku first discovered the Dragon Ball legend and met some of his closest friends. The first 13 episodes had already been released under Pioneer Entertainment, so Funimation, while acquiring the rights, already had a place to start while working on the rest of the series. It was plain to see that the world of anime had its hands full, trying to get as many new series to American viewers as possible. In 2002, something big would happen only to add another positive to anime's success. March of 2002 would once again bring tradition to television with the 74th Academy Awards. It would also be the second year that would feature a brand new staple in the ceremony, the award for Best Animated Feature. 2001 saw the first one given to DreamWorks Shrek, and once again, all the major companies would present their past year's work. It was clear that the odds were in Disney's favor, with three films being nominated in a total of five. They also included the first nominated film by 20th Century Fox, Ice Age. However, one of the films submitted by Disney was something never expected. Hayao Miyazaki Spirited Away, the newest addition to the Studio Ghibli family. The film had seen a limited release in the United States, and not since Grave of the Fireflies did a film of anime origin get tremendous praise from American critics. This film was truly the underdog going up against two of the newest Disney animated classics, Lilo and Stitch and Treasure Planet, but the story of a girl's adventure into an alternate dimension to save her parents was the winner. Unfortunately, in this incredible moment, Hayao Miyazaki was not present to accept the award. 
thanks to his good friend John Lasseter, the dream would soon be realized. Riding on the coattails of this Oscar, the Disney company saw it fitting to bring all of the Studio Ghibli films to the United States. From 2003 until 2005, the Walt Disney Company was hard at work hiring famous faces to record voice tracks while a whole group of home video releases were on the way. Names like James Vanderbeek, Michael Keaton, Brittany Snow, and the Fanning Sisters would all lend their voices to Studio Ghibli films from the past. These films included Castle in the Sky, Porco Rosso, Whisper of the Heart, and others. Even some Studio Ghibli films that had already made it to the United States were restored to be presented to a whole new audience. My Neighbor Totoro and the Princess Mononoke would finally get the acclaim they deserved. Even from the archives would come the fifth Ghibli film, Kiki's Delivery Service. Released in theaters in 1997, featuring the voices of Kirsten Dunst and the late Phil Hartman, the film racked up a large DVD success. The films, of course, would make their ways to American television thanks to an old friend, Cartoon Network. Toonami would feature Miyazaki Film Weeks. Around this time, however, Toonami was doing pretty well for itself, as anime had broken the stereotyping of mecha and big explosions. At this time on television and home video, there was quite a selection to choose from. was everywhere in the first decade of the 2000s, and it was kind of hard to avoid it, especially since anime had been given its own American cable station in 2002 called the Anime Network. Even more so, films, series, and even books had so many different plots and stories to choose from. For the adventurous, you could go anywhere in fantasy quests, like Inuyasha and Ragnarok. You could find worlds of the paranormal, like Chobits and Ah oh My Goddess. For the cyberpunks, you could check out shows like Hack Slash Sign and The Bubblegum Crisis. If you liked fast cars, there was Initial D. For fans of classic adventures, One Piece and Case Closed. For the fans of vampires, there were shows like Helsing, and a few new films like Vampire Hunter D's sequel, Bloodlust, and Blood The Last Vampire. Then there were anime series that didn't involve anything unnatural, like series about teenagers, including School Rumble, Lucky Star, and Azumanga Daio. If you were a fan of shoot-'em-up westerns or crime-fighting, there were shows like Noir and even the popular Trigun. Even anime made fun of itself, like an Excel Saga or Shinshan. Or you could find romantic comedies, like Love Hina, Meisan Koku, and the ever-popular Ranma One Half. The rest of the world would jump on the bandwagon and create their own anime-influenced work. 2003 would feature two major events. In Europe, the famous house music artists Daft Punk would create an anime space opera called Interstellar 5555. Cartoon Network once again would broadcast two new shows. Bruce Timm, already known for his DCAU work, would bring fans Teen Titans, which would be filled with many anime overtones. The theme song of Teen Titans would give birth to the cartoon Hi Hi Puffy Yami Yumi, based around the Japanese singing duo. In 2004, Japan would be capitalizing like never before. The film industry would see the return of Kachuhiro Otomo, the director of Akira, with his new film Steam Boy. The same Japanese animation studio, 4 Degrees, would release the very first anime film combining 2D cell animation and CGI in Appleseed. The Toonami block would also have some of its more popular shows on the air, like Full Metal Alchemist, Bleach, and Samurai Shampoo. 2004 would also be the biggest year for anime in America. As if winning the Oscar wasn't enough, three television shows would be written about in some of the most prestigious American newspapers. After that, the rest would be history. <laughs> Apparently, the worlds of Dragon Ball, Spirited Away, and Pokemon were not enough to show just how big anime had become in American culture. It took three specific shows to grab the attention of the toughest critics of them all, print media. It began with one of the most intense of all anime series. Building on the ever-popular mechas, Neon Genesis Evangelion would be the first to grab American print media attention. Brought to the United States in the late 1990s, it was not until 2002 that the show in its entirety and its two feature films would be given the proper release. The main plot would be the story of a young boy named Shinji as he tried to connect with his father. Instead, his gift of communication would be used alongside two colleagues, 
they would be piloting giant mechas called Evangelion, and they were used to fight mythical monsters foretold by the human history called Angels. The show featured complex plots, disturbing images, and some of the darkest human emotions ever portrayed in animation. The show was given a rave review as something which was known as original and never to be forgotten. In 2003, the show would make it to Cartoon Network's Toonami Block by popular demand. 2005 would feature a first in anime history, the first anime show written and produced by America. Nickelodeon introduced Avatar The Last Airbender, the series that followed the adventures of Aang and his friends who had to bring peace and unity to the world by ending the Grand Fire Lord's War against the other three nations. The show was universally acclaimed by audiences and critics alike and had a successful three-year run. The series was nominated and won various awards, including the Primetime Emmy and even a Peabody. In 2006, Funimation would release a show called Samurai 7 in the United States. Based on Akira Kurosawa's classic film Seven Samurai, the 26-episode series featured the same story with a few additional plot points thrown in. The main basis of the series was the same. Seven Samurai being asked to assist a small village against bandits. Only this time, instead of ancient Japan, the series would take place in a post-apocalyptic future, and the bandits were giant mechas. Even some of the samurai would be part machine. The New York Times gave this series an amazing review, and it would be known as one of the more popular anime series to date. In 2007, the anime world would go back to the big screen thanks to Warner Brothers and the Weinstein Company. Imageye Studios was a studio that wanted to bring anime and CGI together and on a global scale. Its first film was not based on any actual anime series. It was rather based on a famous Japanese-influenced cartoon from the 1980s. TMNT brought the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles back to the big screen since its last blunder of its third live-action film, filled with action and featured a voice cast including Chris Evans, Sarah Michelle Gellar, and Patrick Stewart. However, it was not based on the original story, and the reviews didn't help much. In 2008, there would be another downside as the American economy would fall on hard time. Imagei Studios would get hit hard. 2008 would also deal a huge blow as Toonami would officially go off the air after being one of the flagships in anime programming in the United States. In 2009, Imagei and the Summit Group tried to bring another old anime favorite back to the big screen for a whole new generation. It was the first full-length animated film of Astro Boy, once again featuring in beautiful CGI and a well-known voice cast, including Nicolas Cage, Donald Sutherland, and Kristen Bell. The film unfortunately received mixed reviews and did not live up to its expectations. There were three other animation projects in the works at the time from Imagei. Two of them would be CGI films based around two other classic anime series, Gachamon and Gigantor. In 2010, these projects were cancelled as Imagei Studios closed their doors due to bankruptcy. While the world had only gotten a taste from these now-cancelled film projects, it is uncertain if they will ever resurface or ever be seen again. By 2010, there was no more to be promoted or hyped about anime. This unique animation style was officially one in the same in film, television, and other media. The Wachowski brothers had taken Speed Racer, turning it into a live-action film, and Studio Ghibli saw its first full-length American theatrical release in Ponyo. Even one of America's own creations, Avatar, would be transformed into a live-action film in 2010, directed by M. Night Shyamalan. Even decades later, Transformers would be one of the most popular, with Michael Bay directed films and new television shows. Network television would feature Dragon Ball Z Kai, a condensed series version of Dragon Ball Z. In 2012, Cartoon Network would bring anime back to late night television thanks to Adult Swim. It would feature some of the most popular shows that had already aired on Toonami, such as Cowboy Bebop, Full Metal Alchemist, and Inuyasha. Even some new shows would debut, such as the uncut version of Naruto and Symbiotic Titans, created by Gendi Tartatovsky. 
Even video games would get into the mix thanks to Nintendo. The Wii game Tetsunoko vs. Capcom introduced American gamers to the classic world of Tetsunoko anime productions. It brought forth some anime characters that never made it to America back in the 1970s and 80s. These characters were featured in the series such as Yaraman, Hurricane Polymer, and Gold Lightning. Only time will tell at this point if their anime series will ever make it to the United States. In 2013, Hayao Miyazaki announced his retirement as the head of Studio Ghibli. He felt at this time there was no need to remain there as the dream of making anime a global success was finally realized. A few months before his retirement, America would see a release of the 2011 Ghibli film from Up on Poppy Hill. It had gotten critical acclaim, and that very same year, its 2013 release, The Wind Rises, was one of the favorites at the Canadian Film Festival. Studio Ghibli's second founder, Isaho Takahata, is preparing to debut their latest film in the United States, The Tales of Princess Cayuga. Anime has also seen its share of blunders over the recent years, such as the failed live-action Dragon Ball film, Dragon Ball Evolution, ironically featuring Shameless's Amy Russom and Justin Chatwin. Still, other anime series such as Death Note and the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya are the rage currently in the U.S. An American remake of the Japanese film Old Boy, directed by Spike Lee, is on the way, as well as a new film, 47 Ronin, starring Keanu Reeves. The message is simple. Anime is now one of the most popular genres in film and television across the globe. It is hard to imagine that it has been 70 years since Japan and the United States were at war, and how far we have come as two nations looking to the future. Through many years of trial and error, it is plain to see that through a little hard work and dedication, even the simplest of things like animation can unite two nations together so they can bring the world something imaginative and show us worlds that we never would have expected to see in our wildest dreams.